Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Bones and Stones. Today, we have Nicole Hoffman with us, who's from, who's the, uh, who's from University Museums, and she is the Chief Interpretive Officer. Am I correct? Museum Interpretive Officer. Museum. Oh, look, That's the official designation. Cool, I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather be Chief than Museum, but okay, we'll go. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a Museum Interpretive Officer. And she's here to chat to us a little bit about the University of Pretoria Museums and a bit about her role within those museums. So, Nicole, to kick things off, um, why don't you let us know a little bit about where you've come from and then how you got into UP Museums in the first place? I started uh, studying at the university several years ago, heritage and cultural tourism. One of my major subjects was archaeology, which I immensely enjoyed, and I'm never going to regret that. Um, I carried on with tourism, though, honors and master's level, and I also got a professional qualification as a tourist guide in South Africa. And um, after working as a tutor, then as a lecturer, um, I was looking for new challenges and by chance I heard that a position at the UP museums had opened up and Cyan actually uh, contacted me, the head of the UP museum, Cyan Tylinell. She was uh, like, Nicole, why don't you also send in your application? We'll just see where this goes. And I was lucky. Um, I was really, really fortunate. Um, and um, yeah, then I started as the museum interpretive officer, which means that I'm basically responsible for interpreting the collections on display to visiting um, audiences and also to try to um, entice people to forge connections with the artworks on display, with the archaeological connections to show them that there is a lot of heritage and art that they can actually connect with and enjoy. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, both Nats don't know, but Nicole's helped me out a lot with uh, classes. We've done a number of tours with Nicole uh, through the museum and the collections, and the collections are really actually quite incredible. And the conversations we've had is not just about what is there, but it's also how it's being presented to you, to the public, because there's a lot of challenges that, that Nicole faces. So, Nicole, do you mind just chatting a little bit about some of the things that sort of goes through your mind when it comes to displaying these collections, putting them out for people to see what you choose, how you make sure that it's accessible and inclusive and so on? <laughs> Well, firstly, um, the curation of the collections in as they're being displayed in a museum gallery is not actually my task. That is the task of, of the curators. I'm there to try to um, forge links, to make sure that um, people can interpret and experience these collections um, through their different senses. Um, and that is why it's so important actually, not only to have people walk through the collections on their own, but actually to tell the story, to give them the background, the especially the archeological background of Mapungo Boy, which uh, they might not know. Sometimes the text in a museum gallery can be overwhelming. Sometimes the objects on display are overwhelming and you just see a full big large gallery full of Chinese ceramics and you don't actually understand how you're going to make sense of these and that is my task is um, to show people what firstly what we have on display um, how they were made why they're significant why they should be protected why they're actually useful and um, open to appreciation uh, with regards to art, the technology that went into creating them and those things. So it's really um, also often challenging because we get disabled visitors as well. And we've really started with that towards October last year where I did one-on-one -on -one tours with blind visitors, uh, visually disabled, where you actually need to take them through a museum by touch which is incredibly challenging if everything is behind glass. Yeah. So what I also try to um, give them is a feeling for the rooms they're in, the smells of the wood, um, the different sounds as uh, you get into a bigger gallery, a smaller gallery, um, touch models, 
showing them by taking their hands the shape of objects or ceramic bowls. And not everything is behind glass, thank goodness. Uh, we are a very accessible museum and we also actually allow guide dogs in our museums. That needs to be said yeah. um, to accompany our disabled visitors. So we've had our first canine visitors in the museums <laughs> as well. <laughs> And um, but these tours are incredibly challenging, especially um, for disabled people, um, because um, they are they have so many different needs. Um, I mean, if someone can't hear, I would actually need a translator to translate uh, what I'm telling them. They, however, ha can read. Yeah. And they will feel attracted to the text in a gallery. And then school groups. We also take school groups uh, through the um, museum galleries, um, especially Mapungubwe is part of the school curriculum, grade six. So um, very often school classes. Mm. And now because of COVID, we do actually um, do talks instead of taking people through the museum. We actually enable online talks mm. so that to be accessible to students um, if interested. Yeah. Yeah, I find this, the museum scape, a very interesting place. Mm -hmm. If you're capable and you're able to engage with these different elements, you know, going digital now, appealing to different people mm -hmm. um, from different backgrounds with different abilities, um, and opening those different doors to allow these people to gain access to all of that, because it's something that a lot of our museums aren't doing. For example, visually impaired mm -hmm. people. You know, the experience yes. that the museum versus the experience that I would have is completely different. And I love that element of your talk you did for us last year, discussing some of these concepts and how to start to open these spaces up and, and explore different ways of experiencing them. But before I, you know, carry on for too long, I see Matt, Matt Lotter's got a question. So do you want to take it away? Yes, uh, Nicole, thanks so much. This sounds really uh, quite exciting. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if I am at liberty to share the news that you just shared with us, but congrats on your uh, uh, permanent position appointment, which is fantastic. So we're all very excited for you, well done. Um, but Nicole, maybe if I could just ask you a question, I'm also gonna direct this to Tim as well. Um, you know, Nicole, having been a student, you know, studying archeology span and now working at a museum, uh, you obviously got, you know, uh, an interesting perspective. Um, and then Tim, for you, you know, dealing with students, and you mentioned Nicole has, has done tours for you and stuff with the students and, and all that. Could you perhaps maybe both talk to the benefits of uh, bringing students through a museum? What, what does that allow students to do? Uh, let's use Mapungubwe as an example. You know, when you're learning about the content in class and then taking students into a museum where they can actually see the heritage, I mean, surely that must establish a really strong connection for the students and I'm sure create some inspiration. Definitely. Mapungubwe is such a diverse collection. What is currently on display in the Litsopa Gallery, which forms part of the Mapungubwe Gallery, is mostly ceramics. The gold objects are also on display currently with the Javit UP, but we are in the process of developing a new, brand new bead gallery. Um, and what was impressive for me um, when I was an undergraduate student um, and I actually found out that these collections are available on campus. It means that these are also accessible for study, um, for projects, for doing practicals in a museum environment. And it makes such a difference in comparison to the textbook image and to actually see the detail of the object up close. And I mean, it's, it's a unique opportunity. The museums offer that. And we really encourage uh, the collections to be used more also for academic classes. Yeah, so to jump in there uh, and to echo what Nicole's saying, I think from bringing students into, these, you know, into the museums, what's great is what they get to see the artifacts, they get to see what you're talking about in class, which often you just have pictures of. Um, it helps you explain different processes and procedures with, you know, for example, the um, Let's Opus collection now, we've, I've done a few things with students in there where they get to see the pots, see the process, see the making of these pots and so on. And it makes it a lot more tangible in a way, you know, rather than just talking about what can be very abstract concepts, even something that's physical, but it's the first time people are learning about them. It, it brings this tangible aspect to it because now you get to see it and engage with it and, and, um, and maybe hear a perspective from someone like Nicole on the, on the matter as well. 
So I, I find it to be a really useful thing. And it's lovely to be at a university. Well, all of our universities have museums, but it's lovely to be, lovely to be at a university where you can so easily bring your students into these kinds of spaces. Um, Kara, do you want to, I see you've got a question. Sorry, Nicole. Uh, yeah. No worries. Yeah, um, yeah, this is really fascinating. Thank you for uh, for joining us today. Um, just wanted to to sort of touch base on uh, how how well do you think your degree in archaeology prepared you for the museum environment? Because it, it really sounds like there's a lot of different facets to your job. Um, so yeah, just wanted to see what your your opinion was on that. Working as the interpretive officer is a big big learning curve. Um, you not only work with archaeology but also with art. I have hardly any background in art so I'm learning new things every single day but the benefit of being um, having a background in archaeology and also being an archaeologist because I continued studying archaeology and I'm still busy with it as well um, it just brings so much more depth to the field. You actually you don't just give a general introduction to a gallery. You actually have the capability of taking a school group through or students or even visiting academics. And you show them in, for example, the little gallery with Mapungu Boy ceramics, that they're not only pots, but also figurines, that the pots have different functions, different uses. It gives you a lot more depth because you can point out that traditionally speaking, men were seen as um, affiliated with iron working, with metal working, and ceramics was the domain of females. And this is stuff that um, other people who do not have this background in archaeology, they cannot point out these in-depth uh, things, which I can always add to, to a tour. I judge my audiences while they're with me. And if I see that there, there is a light going on, I know I can explore that point more. And I can see if there is interest or more interest in a certain question. And I can explore that in more detail, which not uh, necessary other people, um, they won't necessarily be able to do that. Um, Nicole, so it opens doors. It definitely does. So with, with, uh, with your job, you've got some really exciting things at your fingertips. The Mapungubwe gold. I mean, that's, that's an incredibly unique find the huge ceramic collection, a lot of archaeological material as well. There's also the heritage campus tours that you do, um, walking around the campus with all the art and, and the displays and so on. What for you is the best part of all of this? Or what find that you look after, you have at your fingertips, is your the, the thing that excites you the most? Well, firstly, uh, what makes my job so fascinating is no um, visitor is like the next one. It's always very different. It's absolutely unique. Um, it's very vibrant and changing. And I need to uh, really prepare for everything very well. My favorite object, however, would probably be, or not object, but a part of the Litsupa Gallery is the miniature ceramics. Um, I'm not sure if we actually have an image for that. I think maybe in one of the gallery images that I sent you. But what is so fascinating is that you can actually see how they were shaped in the hand. Um, these are tiny little objects. Uh, basically, it shows you how ceramic making started out internationally, where people started out with the lump of river clay and they started forming it and pressing in and then pinching the sides. And with one of some of the cruder ones, you can actually see how they were held in the hand. You can see finger marks and fingerprints. So it gives you the human element and that is incredibly fascinating. That's really cool. That's awesome. And I guess even if it's one of the most inconspicuous of objects, it's my absolute favorite because it just shows you these were actual people who handled these objects uh, more than 800 years ago. That's really awesome. That's very cool. Well, look, I think um, we've been sort of um, running out of time here, but thanks very much for joining us. And um, hopefully we'll be, we'll be back on campus soon. And, and I know normally it's the beginning of the year we do our heritage walks. So I'm looking forward to doing it again. Um, but thanks for joining us on the, on, the, on the job. It's awesome. We're very happy for you. And um, hopefully see you soon.
definitely. Thanks to all and for giving me the opportunity to share a bit of my passion with you. Thank you.